Hey guys, I'm Katherine Catalia, Senior Lifestyle Editor here at Bustle. And I'm Emily Shire, Bustle's Politics Editor. And today we are hanging out with Sally Krawcheck. She is CEO and co-founder of Elevest. It's a women's investing platform. And then she's also the author of Own It, The Power of Women at Work. Today we're gonna to talk about money, we're gonna be talking about investing, we're gonna be talking about feminism. And if you have any questions for Sally, you can leave those in the comments and we will definitely get to them when we can. But we have plenty of our own, so we're just gonna <laughs> jump right into it. Um, so Sally, on your website, uh, on Elevest website, right. you stress the importance of invest like a woman. And in yeah. fact, that's the tagline that I know I've heard my friends talk about. It really yeah. sticks yeah. with you. Uh, it's excellent marketing. But what, what do you mean by that? Well, actually, for a while, when we were doing our initial Facebook ads, we had invest like a woman, and then we had what the beep, 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 beep <laughs> does that mean? Um, and what first of all, what it means is to do it because women don't invest as much as men do. So we talk so often about the gender pay gap. But there's also a gender investing gap, which can cost the folks who are watching now and the women in this office hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars over the course of their lives. So we're sort of also moving from invest like a woman and we're moving a bit toward the messaging of money is power. Given what's going on in the world today, um, given that we live in a capitalist society, we know that if we women don't have as much money as men do, we're not financial. We're not equal with men until we're financially equal with men. So, invest like a woman means let, let's get investing. You know, hopefully through Elevest, but if, you know, if you want to choose someone else, that's fine too. Um, and to take back our power. I have to say, as a person who is terrible with money just across the board. Investing is a really scary word to yes. me, and I'm sure that that's true for a lot of people who are probably tuning in right now. Yes. Why is that? How do we make it less scary? Because I think the industry wants you to think that, <laughs> right? If they throw jargon at you, if it's a ton of different products, if they speak in war and sports analogies, which is for the guys, if we perpetuate this view that math is for boys, if we perpetuate the view that investing is for men, if financial advisors who are adorable, they're wonderful, but they're 86% men and their average age is in their late 50s or early 60s, if investing TV looks like NFL Sunday, if the industry symbol is a bull, which is a phallic symbol, <laughs> what it says to you in every way is this is not for you. And what it says for you is this is not approachable. Um, a lot of the firms have gone higher end, so you need two fifty, two hundred fifty thousand dollars in order to invest, right? So it, in every way, I've got to find a guy with a mahogany desk who I don't know because I'm a thirty-four year old woman or a twenty-eight year old woman or a thirty-six year old woman. How do I find one of those guys beyond you know being a friend of my dad? So it feels removed and it feels intimidating. And so part of what we're trying to do is with no minimum at Elevest and no jargon, if I can't explain it in a way we can understand it, then I'm not explaining it well enough. We work to help women invest. So talk us through Elevest a little bit. I mean, what, first of all, makes it so like, women-centric yeah. and why is it, yes. what makes it stand out from the rest? Well, first of all, it is worth noting that when we did put out the initial Invest Like a Woman, some folks, and the majority of folks said terrific, Fantastic, glad it's there. A sizable minority said, how dare you? What do you think the, my woman brain can't understand big man numbers? And this is sexist. And they would then go into the site and look at it. And somebody would come back and they'd start to have a conversation and people would say, wait, it's actually not sexist, it's feminist. I'll tell you why in a second. And you know what? It is more sophisticated than what's out there, I think. And the conversation would change, but it's worth noting not a single person ever said, it's for women, it must be better. Not a single person, right? Now for women, we believe it is better because we spent hundreds of hours with women like the ones who are watching. And in addition to doing some really important things like, oh, you know, taking into account we live longer than men. <laughs> really important for your financial plan and your retirement plan. We take into account things like the fact that our salaries sadly peak sooner than men's do. Um, so what we do in talking with women is it's not about making money for more money's sake, and it's not about outperforming. It's about helping you go through a process in which you identify and we quantify for you your financial goals in life. I want to, I want to get the heck out of bustle. 
Actually, just kidding, she does not. Um, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I want to start my own business. I want to have a family. I want to buy a house. I need an emergency fund. I want to retire well. We take in your financial information. We use a very powerful algorithm. We calculate what you can afford. And sometimes we deliver bad news. No, you know, no house for you. <laughs> but then you might say, well, That's probably true. Yeah, we go. <laughs> but I'll retire later. I'll make some trade-offs. I'll figure it out, right? Maybe I'll retire with less money. And then we put together a fully customized investment um, portfolio for you that works to get you not to outperform the market because that doesn't matter, but that works to get you to your goals in the substantial majority of market scenarios. If you fall off track, you didn't make a monthly deposit, et cetera, um, then we reach out to you and tell you what you do to need. You, you, you uh, speak, Sally, I'm going to speak now, what you need to do to get back on track. So very different from, hey, I'm going to invest. I just logged in. Do I pick a mutual fund or an ETF? Right, which is what stops a lot of women cold. Right. Yeah. Like those words yeah. right now already are giving me Of anxiety. course. <laughs> of course. Right? But what we're a fiduciary. So we are obligated to act in your best interest. We have got decades of experience. That's these wrinkles here <laughs> and the whole thing that's going on there are under no my neck. There, <laughs> there's a whole bunch of stuff. like six inches away. I want a whole bunch of stuff. I wanted to look like five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but we have a ton of experience. We're a fiduciary. Let us do our job. Mm -hmm. Your job is to make your money here, go get your raise here, decide what you want to accomplish. Our job is to work to get you there by investing for you. And I've been wondering that. I think we were both wondering about mm -hmm. this when we were thinking out questions. Women seem often more hesitant to talk about money and yes. specifically their salaries. What is your advice about that? Do you think women yeah. should be talking yeah. to each other about their salaries more and other financial goals? And yes, because <laughs> how do we talk about sex so often and we don't talk about money? It's the damnedest thing, right? It's very strange. Like you two have talked about sex, right? We have. We yeah, talked about dating. We don't. I mean, we yeah, talked about money because, because my mother of watching this. Yeah, 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 but no. would you typically? You're like ah, and I think because money is how much we're deemed to be worth. Um, money is our dreams for our future, our hopes. Money is a weird thing. We feel weird if we make more money than our brother does. We feel weird if we make less money than our sister does. You know, there's a weirdness about it. So should we talk about it? Sure. If you don't, however, <laughs> right? If you're not going to get there today just by me telling you, what's really great and different from when I was your age like a couple years ago, um, you're Good, you didn't laugh. <laughs> when I was back in your generation, <laughs> is when I would go in to ask for my raise, I had no idea how much to ask for, like none, right? Today, if the two of you don't talk about it, then you can go to payscale.com or getraise.com or Comparably or Hired or any of a number of sites such that you have much more information. So that when you're going in to get what you're worth, you've got resources and sources for it instead of just going into it blind. Well, in your book, you actually say that investing your money is the best career advice that yes. no one is talking about. Yes. Can you unpack that for us a little bit? Okay, so first of all, here's what <laughs> drives me crazy about some journalists who do not work at Bustle. <laughs> is you'll often, when, when we actually were starting to launch Elevest, there were a number of articles that were written, and they said, well, okay, maybe there's a gender investing gap, right? Maybe there is. And maybe this LFS will work, but gee, by the way, the big banks have tried it, and a couple other, and it didn't work, so it can't possibly work. I'm like, dude, you know, if it had already worked, we wouldn't, there wouldn't be an opportunity for us, but so be it. But they would sort of finish the articles with, well, okay, but until the real societal issue of the gender pay gap is solved, then we're, you know, then we haven't solved it. And that to me is like saying, you know, I broke my leg and I broke my arm until I fix my damn leg. <laughs> you know, I'm going to let my arm dangle uselessly from my right. body. Right. It just doesn't make any sense. You can do both. And the gender pay gap, again, can cost women hundreds of thousands or millions over their life, but so can the gender investing gap. And so what most women are doing today is they're leaving most of their money in cash. And it's earning about 0% as opposed to earning for a diversified investment portfolio, call it 6%. Equities historically have earned about 9% over long periods of time. Those differences are life-changing. They're absolutely life-changing. And why I say it's the best career advice women aren't getting, it may be the best life advice, right? Because you can do it, 
You can reduce your perceived risk by doing, you know, investing a bit out of every paycheck. So sometimes you're buying high, sometimes you're buying low, right? And it evens out in theory over time or has historically. Um, but you tell me, do you feel better going into Lindsay's office and saying, you know what, I want that new assignment, right? I'm, I'm sick of what I'm doing. I want that new one. Or do you feel better walking into her office and saying, I want to go overseas? Mm -hmm or I want to work from home on Fridays, or I want to be mentored by the new person who's the hot shot. Do you feel better going into her office to quit because she's being a jerk? You're not, <laughs> that I've heard of. Not, that, not to the best of my knowledge. But do you feel better going in to quit to go work someplace else with more money or less, right? Do you feel better starting your own business with more money or less? Mm -hmm. Do you feel better leaving the boyfriend or girlfriend who was so terrific five years ago and now is a complete jerk with more money or less. And so investing, if you can make up that money that we're leaving on the sidelines today, it actually can enable you to play looser in your career because you know you've got more of a cushion behind you. Okay, so I know I'm probably doing this wrong, but I want you to tell it to me to my face. Yes. All of my money currently is just being housed in a savings account because I, I first of all, don't really know what it is I'm supposed to be doing right. with it. But yeah. I think that's also a problem that a lot of people, not, not necessarily a problem, but just a thing that a lot of women do. And people in general don't know that they shouldn't just keep their money in a savings account. That's what you've been doing since you were in third okay, grade. Okay, so why are you doing that? I think the reason I personally am doing it, I started a savings account when I was very, very right. little. I thought I was being very financially yeah. responsible in third grade. And I've just sort of maintained it. And occasionally when I think to, I will put money in there, but then I forget that it exists. Okay. But it also just seems very safe to me. I feel yes. like investing, I just immediately start to think of like all the risks that might be involved. And I don't even know where to be investing in the first place or how much money I should be investing. And there are all right. these like what ifs that are out there. Right. And so I've just been keeping it there. And I know that's wrong, but I can't say exactly why it's wrong. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, so we tend to, because we as women are not more necessarily risk averse, but risk aware, we think about those risks. And you probably haven't had anybody answer that for you, right? What is the real risk? And I've had women say to me, I'm scared of losing everything. Well, if you're invested in a diversified investment portfolio, not a single stock, but you know, a range of exchange traded funds, which is what we do at Elevest, if you lose everything, I assure you, we're going to have bigger problems than that, right? That's going to be like the right. least of your worries, in, in my opinion. Um, so what, you know, the way to mitigate that risk that so many women think about is don't think about investing as one and done. If you invest a bit out of every paycheck, then as mentioned, you know, sometimes you will be buying when the market is high, but other times you'll be buying when the market is lower, and you'll even it out over time. So. For markets like, you hear about, oh, the crash of 1929 took decades to recover. Sure, if you put the money in the day before and did nothing else. If you then invested steadily through the down market, you were buying low. And so the recovery was much sooner. The crash of 2007, 2008, I think was, you know, wasn't years and years of recovery. It was a relatively short period of time. So by doing that, you start to dip your toe into the water and you start to gain the confidence. And then if you're with someone like an Elevest, mm -hmm. You know, what you really want to know is how bad, you know, tell me how bad it can get, right? And tell me if I'm off track. And tell me what I have to do if I want to get back on track. And we do that for you, right? We, we show you a little graph over time and show you in, you know, a reasonable worst case scenario what it is, reasonable best case scenario. But we put it in a concrete language you can understand. But let me do this for you just to, <laughs> just to upset you. Great. So I, don't, I have no idea how much money you make. But if you made $85,000 mm -hmm. um, a year, if you were doing what experts say, which is you should have 50% of your salary should go for needs, 30% should go for fun, and 20% should go for long-term investing and saving. All right? So right. you're doing that. You're putting that 20% in the bank account. You're not investing. And you wait 10 years to invest, which you probably already did. You know how much that costs you a day? I don't want to know. I'm scared. You should be scared because it's a hundred dollars. <laughs> oh, great! A day, yeah, $100 a hundred dollars a day. So that's the power of compounding. Thanks for doing that math. That's Emily. the power <laughs> of compounding, right? That you see over time. So if you were to leave here and you had a hundred dollars fall out of your pocketbook, mm -mm. How, when would you fix your pocketbook? Well, after I stopped crying. I yeah, guess. of course. That's my point. <laughs> yeah. But you wouldn't do it like for three days, right? <laughs> You'd pretty fit, fast pick that, fix that. And you know, what I'm wondering as we're going through all of this and something I've certainly thought about and uh, my 
financial savings yeah. approach is not so <laughs> different uh, from Catherine's. Good to know. How much time would you recommend is the resp that I should responsibly allocate to investing? How much time should be part of my daily routine, weekly, monthly, something I check See, in See, this times is a year. the thing. Yeah. Because of all these myths that have built up around investing and because of the messages we get, we think it takes forever. So I was in Silicon Valley this summer and a really sharp woman said to me, I'm going to take off two weeks this summer to figure out investing. By the way, the guys, we love guys, totally <laughs> love guys, right? Amazing mm -hmm. individuals. They don't do this in general. The research shows that we women will say we need to take the time because we need to understand the jargon. Oh, the company asked me what my risk tolerance is. I need to figure that out. I got to buy the book. I need to understand okay. the details. And so I'm going to put that time aside. The guys actually invest right through that. They are, we think I need financial education. We do, but so do they, but they invest right through that. And so what we've built at Elevest is something where we've seen women go through the process in 11 minutes. 15 minutes, 30 minutes in general. I mean, the time it takes to do a load of wash. And then how much time should you invest in it? As much as you want, you know, but you can come and check in it. Am I still on track? Yep, I'm on track. They didn't reach out to me, so I know I'm still <laughs> on track, right? And, and you can just let us, as a fiduciary, take that responsibility. Well, yeah, for those of you who are just tuning in, we are talking to Sally Krawczak. She is the co-founder and CEO of Elevest, and we are talking about money, feminism, answering all your financial questions. Leave those in the comments, and we'll get to them. Uh, cool. Should we uh, should we talk about that that ad campaign? The fantastic <laughs> ad campaign that probably many of you watching at home already know. Um, it is the shadowy picture of our president. Uh, that says, women of New York, cover your, I can say this, ass, but ass, <laughs> ass <laughs> written as dollar signs. Sign. Um, it's something that stops you in your track, because we were just talking about it. There's one right near the bus mm -hmm. office, and we were all talking about it. Uh, so we would love to hear a little bit more yeah. about how that campaign started. How did you come up with the idea? When did you come up it with the idea? It involved alcohol. <laughs> as as all well, <laughs> not be at all surprised to hear. Um, we were actually um, in my home one evening, a group of us. We were drinking some, you know, a nice Chardonnay, and we were talking about what we were hearing from, we call her L, right? The, the woman who is looking to invest, the woman who is you know, 28, you know, up to 42, who's sort of generally in our market, and particularly in New York, and what she was feeling as we were coming to the end of the year. And while there are many folks in many parts of the country who are, yes, score Trump, um, what this woman was feeling was concern, you know, the sense that these, this march of feminism had stopped short. We've seen it in politics. We also have seen it in business, as I talk about in my book. And there's a sense of how do I take my power back? And so we've been playing with the idea and the thought of money is power, right? Um, and that is a way, whether it's investing, getting that raise at work, starting your own business, using all the technology that's available to us to know what our worth is, to close our gender money gaps. Um, the, the idea of money and power, the environment we're in today, all sort of coalesced around this, this issue. So. Um, I have a very talented team. They put this together. They sent it to me. I went to sleep and said, no effing way are we doing this. I mean, we're just not going to do this. And I woke up and I'm like, oh, what the hell? Let's, let's put it up and start this conversation, you know, with the women in the neighborhood about money and power and the times that we're in. And, and it, it, it started a conversation. Yeah. I, would, I mean, it's definitely jarring just yeah, walking down the street. What kind of feedback have you gotten about it? Um, we, uh, a lot, as a matter <laughs> of fact. And it was controversial, which and it was it, it evoked an emotion, which is what we were looking to do. Um, and look, some of it was okay, not funny. Um, it was funny before the inauguration. We got some not guys, not funny. And post the inauguration, as some of the executive orders started to come out, it was interesting because then the groundswell we could really start to we could start to feel it. Uh, but we had people stopping, doing selfies with it you know, posting them on Instagram, sending them to us, it really seemed to have struck a nerve. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. And how do you navigate that? We were talking about it a little bit before the Facebook Live, but the world of politics, when you don't want your 
a woman who's a Republican to feel like she can't go to Elevest? Right. And how, how do you navigate kind of the financial world when you don't want it to become necessarily a partisan issue? What are the thoughts that go through your head, even yeah. just from a marketing perspective? Well, I understand that. Um, and as we were talking about before, I think it's almost impossible to separate the concept of money and women and feminism. Because again, if money represents power in a capitalist society, then it is by nature a feminist issue. Um, that we are not today financially equal with men, and so we are not today equal with men. We do not today have the degrees of freedom that men have in our lives. You know, and if you're in a marriage, you know intuitively what the research tells you, which is that if you are divorced, his standard of living goes up by a double digit percent and yours goes down, right? And so there are women who, because of this, are caught in situations they wouldn't otherwise be caught in. And so I don't think we thought of ourselves as political at all when we started, but because this came to such a head in the issue of what direction does feminism go in now? How does feminism restart itself now? And what I heard from woman after woman after woman after woman after woman is what can I do? What can I do? Right? And what, you know, some women are taking to the streets. Um, some women are, you know, communicating with their congressional representative. And what we're hearing again and again is I want to take care of myself and take care of other women. The, the um, surveys we've done have shown something like 80 plus percent of professional women who we've surveyed want to take an action. And a real action is investing, taking care of yourself, getting rid of that raise, making yourself financially stronger. So I don't think we can get away from it, quite frankly. Yeah. So you've talked about how women's success in business is essentially the fourth wave of feminism. Yeah. We just discussed that just now. Yeah. You even have an entire chapter in your book called How the World of Work is Changing. I just am curious to get your insight. How do you think things are changing right now? I think especially um, a lot of women feel like we're kind of taking a step back right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I just, especially given the political atmosphere, I mean, I think we need something to kind of hang on to and be excited about. But here, it's the one hand, the other hand. So on the one hand, the research is clear that when we women um, are part of diverse teams, when we're on teams with guys in senior leadership positions, companies perform better, not by a little, by a lot. This is true of startups, where first round capital has said the returns on their startups with women in leadership positions are 63% better than <laughs> men only. We see it higher returns on equity, lower risk, greater innovation, greater employee engagement, greater um, consumer engagement. I mean, it's across the board. And yet we've stalled out, right? So we make them better, but the progress has stalled out. In my old industry, investing in Wall Street's gone backwards. It's crazy. So there's this, oh no. Here's the positive part of it. One, women are looking to take action. But two, the business world is changing and changing rapidly. We talked earlier about asking for the raise. Back in my day, you know, I didn't know what to ask for. Now we have all sorts of resources that can triangulate for me what I'm worth. Back in the day, if a company didn't treat me well and I wanted to go to another company, you and I would have to go out for a drink and I'd be like, hey, what's it like at Bustle? And you'd be like, yeah, it's really cool. And then I have a sample set of one, and I come work at Bustle, and maybe you were right, and maybe you weren't. Today, we have got all sorts of resources. One I heard about the other day is In Her Sites, which is crowdsourced culture reviews from 35,000 women. I can go to Fairy Godboss and compare the parental leave policies across companies. So all of a sudden, I can go to companies with reviews, information, much more information. So I've got power. Power when I ask for the raise, power when I go to a new company, and power to start my own business. So Elevest, I couldn't have started 10 years ago or even five years ago. But, you know, but now we've gone from, I used to have to buy all the servers to the information can be in the cloud. I used to have to rent long-term office space. Now it can be WeWorks. I used to have to go on business trips. Now it can be video conferences. You know, it used to be you had to hire all HR department. Now it can be Zenefits or one of the others. Right? I mean, the, the opportunity to take down the cost and start businesses is really dramatic. And so what, what I think is going to happen is, is either now companies will get it, yeah, they haven't before, or they'll be hollowed out because we will have the information to take the action and we can start our own things, which is amazing 
Because if we start our own things, we're building the companies at which other women want to work. And we're building companies that better serve women, right? You know, no one was going to build Elevest but a woman. The guys have been trying it for a long time, and they, they've failed again and again to come up with the right offering. And so I think we're just going to make the world a better place. Well, you touch on a lot of issues with that, one of which is that as much as Elevis is about helping you to invest better yeah. and to make more money over your lifetime, it's not necessarily all about money. You brought up how a lot of, not just women, all employees care about the culture of a company, yes. and millennials care about the culture of a company a lot more, and other benefits. And so. From your perspective, as someone who has held you know, many different top roles in some of the biggest corporations in the world, let's say you go in for that conversation out the raise yeah. and you don't get it. And let's yeah. say it's because you think you know, there are legit reasons, either it's a rough time for the company, yeah, what yeah, have sure. you. What is your advice? Because I think a lot of, yeah. I know a lot of my peers wonder about this. What are the other things you should think about and negotiate for yeah. to make Great that experience question. work? And that's one of my issues with so much of the literature about asking for raises. It's just yes or no. And then <laughs> they say no, you're like, oh, no. Um, ask for, come, with, come in with 10 other things, right? Ask, you know, to be put on the special project that all the hotshots are working on. Ask to be sent to coding class and have the company pay for it. Ask for an executive MBA. Ask for time off to go to coding class if the company won't pay for it. Ask to do a, you do a few months in France in their office over there. Ask to work Fridays from home. Ask for a rotation in the finance. Ask, 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 right? And if, by the way, eventually your boss is going to say no because by like the eighth no, it's getting weird. <laughs> it's just getting weird. And so eventually the boss is going to say, okay, fine, you can have that. Ask for the new title, right? Ask for stuff. And then, you know, have that list. So those are things that make you more valuable as an employee so that they turn into money later, okay? And you're teaching your boss to, be, you, to negotiate with you, to see you as a negotiating partner, as a problem solver together, and you're teaching your boss to begin to say yes to you. And you're right, that can happen. And one or two times, look, you know, it's a tough time at the company, look, we just can't do it, that, that happens. The third or the fourth time, you know, the company's having a tough time, we can't afford it. You might want to say, maybe this is not a company I want to be at because that doesn't sound really great about this company. Or you're blowing a lot, you know, blowing smoke at me, right? In which case, it's okay to quit. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay to go, you know, someplace else. And I think your generation is better at it than mine, but my generation just wouldn't quit. It's just like, okay, you know, I'm committed to this job, I'm committed to this company. And they won't go, and it's okay to go someplace else. Well, that's something sometimes friends uh, have wondered about, which is, I don't know if this is what you mean by quitting, but what are your thoughts on quitting when you don't have another job lined up? It's, it's not ideal. Um, and I've taken three career breaks. One, because I quit when I didn't have another job lined up, and two, because I you know, got fired mm -hmm. and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> Things happen. Yeah, you know, it happened. It's, um, you know, I hold, I, I like to say I hold a world record for being the only woman fired on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> so I got that going for me, uh, which is nice, which is really good. Um, <laughs> it, look, it's not ideal. Um, but of course, if you're in a hostile work environment, Sometimes you got to get you got to get the heck out of there, um, but just recognize that career breaks can be amazing. The one that I took when I was in my late twenties was life changing because I was going from being an investment banker, which I hated, and never had the time to reflect on what I really wanted to do. So it was when I was on that break that ah, you know, I need to be a sell side equity research analyst. I know, every, like every young woman, <laughs> um, and I never would have gotten to that without the break. But a break is expensive. And so the way the numbers work is if you're making that $80,000 a year and you take a two-year career break, you think it's going to cost you $160,000, but it typically costs more than a million because you typically take a, a pay cut when you come back and you get raises off that lower level for the rest of your career. So I'd say career break, yes, but really think through the numbers and make sure you're making effective use of it. All right, well, we compiled a couple of financial questions that we personally are too oh, afraid to ask okay. that we're going to ask you. But if you guys who are watching have any questions, if anybody in this room has any questions, shout those out and we'll get to all of them. Um, kind of going off of the raise conversation that we were just having, what do you do if your coworker is making more than you and you have the same job title? How do you start that conversation with your boss about, you know? Without know. going in and like slamming the door? Be like, what's wrong? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Look, what I would do is I'd go back, go back to those resources, check those out that we talked about before, whether it's Get Raised or PayScale or any of them, just so you've got your facts set. Um, because sometimes coworkers can exaggerate or have a glass of wine or <laughs> forget stuff. Um, and then go have a reasonable discussion with the boss about, okay, this is what I believe I'm worth. These are my sources of information. Um, how do we get me there, right? What is it? Why am I not there today? What do you need to see? You know, what's the path to get there? And, you know, maybe he or she will say, ah, oh, you caught me. Here's the raise. But typically, I think that will end in a discussion about these are the accomplishments for the year. And the more you can quantify them, in my opinion, the better. X new clients, this kind of net promoter score, these types of projects, as opposed to, I think you did a good job. Now, this one's a little more logistical, <laughs> uh, but let's say you don't have you had a ton of money to invest. Let's say you can't, at this moment, put away 20% yeah. of your salary yeah. towards long-term, and it's only like 1000 or $2,000. Is that worth investing? Yes. Or, okay. Still? Sorry, Good to yes. know. <laughs> well, he, so a couple of things. First of all, at Elevest, we have no minimum. So we, you know, it's not great for us, but we do have accounts that have a dollar in them, um, which, you know. Really? We, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's important for a couple of reasons, one of which is um, that what might be, what you might think is not a lot for a company could be a lot for you on your, sal on your salary. Um, and you want to get, you want to start that so you've got the impact of that compounding, right? Again, we've been so conditioned by the investing industry as, as, as it is today that it's got to be hundreds of thousands of dollars. Investing $1,000, fantastic. Investing $10,000, fantastic. And you want to get in the habit. You want to take a bit out of every paycheck so that it's just what you do. And start with, well, first of all, you've got to pay off your credit card debt. You have to pay off any debt that's above 6 7%. You want to be investing in your 401k at work because of the tax benefits. You want to have some cash set aside, ideally three months of take-home pay, maybe one, maybe two in case of an emergency. And then you want to invest 1% of your paycheck, 2%, 3%. You know, start small and take it up over time um, so that you're making it a habit and you're beginning to have the impact of compounding. Wow. Okay, then. There we go. Pass that money, ladies. <laughs> there we go. Does anybody in here have any questions? We do have one. Yes. <laughs> Hello. Um, first of all, this has been very inspiring, and I just signed up for LFS. Oh. <laughs> um, just on the website. Great. But I do have a question. What, when you say investing, and this might be like a silly question, but what am I actually investing in? Yeah. Great. It's other a, than my future. Oh, well, there we go. <laughs> or your home that you want to buy, or yourself. Right. Um, the actual security. So, um, we invest in exchange traded funds. If you know, you may be familiar with a mutual fund. The, these, both of these products tend to be aggregations of securities. Typically, it could be stocks, can be bonds, etc. Stocks represent partial ownership of a company. So you're buying little pieces of companies and you're buying it through these vehicles where you're buying a broad range of these stocks and or other securities. So we invest in exchange traded funds typically at Elevest because they are so low cost, because they give you broad market exposure. So we'll invest in what was called a large cap, large company, um, types of investments in the United States. We'll invest in smaller companies outside the United States, for example. So what we want to do is give you what's called a diversified investment portfolio. Um, so you're not investing in just this stock, but across a broad range of them. You know, back in the day, um, people used to buy and sell stocks. So I'm, I bought, my first stock I bought was Ann Taylor, and my second stock I bought was, I don't know, Merrill Lynch or something like that. That's a loser's game. I've done this long enough, I promise you it's a loser's game. I used to, even though it's what I do, I'd buy well, I'd forget to sell. You know, better to keep, and so the cost would be high because of the trading, better to keep the cost as low as you can and invest in those broad diversified portfolios. We have another question. Hello. Um, I started using Elevest a few weeks ago, actually. It's a very um, lovely experience that I had on the website. Um, and you put in all of your information, and it suggests what kind of accounts you should have. Yeah. And I had a couple things suggested to me. And one of the things I ended up going with was a traditional IRA. Yeah. 
and I was talking to some of my coworkers, and they said, oh, you should Rothar. have a Roth IRA. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah. I don't know. Like, well, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Why yeah. should I? So my question is, yeah. what should I have? Is there a difference? Should I have both? Is that yeah. Yeah. redundant? Yeah. So... <laughs> To do this for me, because I'm not allowed to, I don't know your particular circumstances, so it's a hard question to answer without knowing those. And by the way, I'm not allowed to answer it. Um, anyway, certainly in this uh, set of circumstances, go on to our website. Go to the Ellevest Resource Center. Um, and there are a series of articles there about the different types of investments that we have. E each of those can be terrific. They are chosen based on what your existing, they're, they're both tax advantaged in different ways, and they're chosen based on what your existing situation is today and what it's forecast to be in the future. And so based on the inputs there, one will be recommended over another, but they're both terrific tax advantaged ways to save for retirement. Okay. And one more question. We have a Facebook comment from Maria. She wants to know, is there anything to help you get rid of student loans other than paying it off for the next 50 years? Yeah, um, <laughs> so uh, Maria, it's Maria? Maria. Maria, so this is another place. Go take a look again on the website, Ellevest, E L L E V E S T dot com. Um, go click on Resource Center, and we've got a number of articles on student loans and, and paying them back. Um, typically, what you're going to want to do is before you start investing, if you have student loans that are costing you 7% or more, you're going to want to prioritize paying those things back because as we estimate it, the chances of the market outperforming that over time, you're better and you're safer if you pay them back. For loans that are, call it less than 3% type of cost, we think those are okay to keep outstanding because the market performance over time, we believe can, um, there can be an increment to that, what on Wall Street one calls an arbitrage, and you can earn more by investing versus paying the things off. Um, we also have some, some uh, tips in there for other things to do, such as going to some startups like Earnest, I believe, is one of them, where you can look to consolidate your student loans and take down the cost. And then there's some old-fashioned tips as well, which is we have one woman in our office who pays her student loan debt on time all the time, and then every six or nine months she calls the provider and asks to have the rate taken down, and sometimes they don't and sometimes they do. Um, as well, there's also tips around consolidating your student loans you know, having automated payments, and that, that can often take the rate down by, I think it's 25 um, or a quarter of a percentage point. So chipping away at it in these different ways can be useful um, overall, but take a look at that rate and pay off, try to pay off the high interest rate ones, keep the lower ones outstanding. All right, and one more question. Another Facebook comment from Kara. She wants to know, if you have lots of credit card debt, should you ever use your retirement? Uh, borrow out of your retirement account in order? I don't love that. Um, I would, the way I would prioritize it is prioritize it and really cut back on um, your spending. You know, if you have enough credit card debt, that can mean moving into a smaller apartment. It can mean a lot more dinners in as opposed to dinners out in order to start to pay that back off. The rule of thumb really should be with credit cards, if you cannot afford to buy it um, without putting it on a credit card and rolling it over, you can't afford to buy it. For some people, that means they should have a debit card, which they pay back every month, but the credit card can be such poison to you. If, you're, if you've got cash on hand, some of the worst advice I hear is, um, oh yes, have your emergency fund and leave your credit card debt outstanding. That is a really bad idea. You should take that whole emergency fund, sweep it out, pay back your credit card debt. What if I have an emergency? Then run up your credit card again is the, is the short answer to that. But, you know, the discipline of saving for retirement and putting money in what's tax, a tax advantage savings vehicle, uh, particularly, by the way, and I don't know your personal circumstances, if you have a match at work, that means you're getting the tax advantage plus you're getting free money. That's an instance where I'd like you to, you know, I'd like you to try to wall that off and, and pay off the credit card debt from cash flow. All right. Well, Sally, thank you so much. This has been very enlightening. Great. Incredibly eye-opening. <laughs> Good. I think we're all going to be uh, thinking about our finances quite a bit more now, <laughs> everyone in this office, and hopefully all of you who are watching. Come on, guys. Let's, let's step yeah, it take, up. Take that power, right? Yeah. Take that power.
question. Um, if people want to find out more information about Elevest, they can go to Elevest.com. Yeah, you know what I'll ask you to do, you can find out more about Elevest at Elevest.com. The other thing that I would point you towards and for your homework, um, that if you go also to the resource center there or you type in Elevest and Mind the Gap into your browser, we have got a free guidebook called, which goes through the six or seven gender money gaps and how to close them. So we hit on the gender pay gap, resources for closing that, obviously the gender investing gap, but the gender debt gap, the gender expense gap, you name it, completely free. And it can help you, you know, even if you're not ready to start investing, sort of get some more money. <laughs> Always a good thing. I really yeah. want more money. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay. <laughs> Thank you, Sally. Thank you. Thank you.